I'm Richard Reese, and I'm here to present the visions that led to the plan that led to the city of Rancho Santa Margarita. What do I mean by visioning? Visioning to me is perception with purpose and intent to bring forth something that did not exist prior to your unique expression of it in a manner that is nurturing to yourself and others. And that was the philosophy that grounded all of the planning and design work that we did. Your new community planner visioning occurs in three stages with the first two evolving the third. And the first one is the historical past vision. What are the roots of this place and how did it evolve over time? X is pragmatic present vision. What's so right now? Geophysical, environmental, cultural, economic, and political. And then the third is the possible futures vision. And given your understanding of the historical past and pragmatic present, possible futures are evolved in sequence, master planning, and urban design studies. The uh, possible future vision for Rancho Santa Margarita was first stated as an affirmation that guided these processes. And that affirmation I wrote 30 some years ago, over 30 years ago. So what I'm telling you tonight is a true story, but it happened 30 years ago. Vision affirmation was, it is possible to create an urban village in an open space setting that provides the opportunity for its people to choose to live lifestyle expressions that reach beyond the mere satisfaction of basic human needs for air, water, food, shelter, safety, and economic opportunity while embracing wellness, well-being, full self-expression, and participating governance as normal, everyday activities. And that was the affirmation that we started with looking at a cattle pasture in the Plano Tribuca Valley. This is the way it turned out. All of the possible future visions from our planning process came from all of the planning vision, future visions that I had had in a 40 year career in city planning. Everything that I'd ever done before possible futures found its home here in the Plano Tribuca Valley. Let's explore the idea about how a past vision and a present vision coming together can change your perception of possible uh, futures. You can't get any more past than the universe. And here's a picture of the universe. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. And everybody sort of thought it was just some big black space that went on forever. And then this picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope that looked back 12 billion years. And this is what they saw. And every dot on there is not a star, a galaxy of stars. And you can't see it too clear right now, but there's little dots that go on forever. Well, that's a little vague for planning a new community in, Ranch, in the Plano Tribuca Valley. So let's get closer to home. And we all know this. It's not vague at all. Because there's our sun, one of the outer uh, rings or arms of the Milky Way galaxy. And there's eight planets orbiting around it. And it just happens that it is the luckiest planet in the galaxy and maybe the universe, because just far enough away from its sun to be perfect for a human habitation. If it was any closer, it'd burn up. If it was any further away, it would freeze. Wouldn't be sitting here tonight for sure. Okay, get a little closer. And we all growing up had a vision of planet Earth. I mean, we had those little globes in our front rooms and we all subscribed to National Geographic Magazine. We knew where the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean was. And this kind of verified it, but this was taken by a human being standing on the moon. The past and the present came together, and we suddenly saw what the planet really looked like. And if you look carefully, 
here's the Gulf of California, and that yellow spot right above it is where we're all sitting tonight. But let's take a look at planet Earth without any clouds, NASA photographs. And there's obviously places there that look like they could support human life better than others, and that's true. He drew an imaginary line through the Panama Canal and over past the entrance to the Red Sea and beyond, and you called it the equator. And then you went 40 degrees north of the equator and 40 degrees south of the equator. You'd find out that there's only five places on planet Earth that are most suitable, the best places to live for human habitation. Two north of the equator, three south. Coast of Chile, Cape Town, South Africa, and Perth, Australia on the south, and on the north, the Mediterranean Sea, and guess what? Southern California from San Diego to Santa Barbara, the only place on the North American continent with the Mediterranean climate. That was a possible future that went into the memory for Rancho Santa Margarita. Let's look at California. And here we are down here, Southern California. And a book was written called West of the West. And the author noted or claimed his idea was that California was unique, one of a kind, in that it really was a state of mind that existed west of the historic West. And that it all began with the gold rush in 1849 when people from all over the world came to California seeking their, free, their fortune and an enhanced lifestyle. And they were a cross-cultural, multi-ethnic, and economically diverse uh, group of people. And Alan Toffler, the futurist, wrote a book where he noted, if you wanted to see the way the rest of the world was going to live, Look at the people in Southern California, because they're already living the future. And so the people continue to come. There was a flood of people that arrived after the uh, end of the war in the Pacific and everybody coming home. So how did that all turn out? Well, not too well. Here's the greater Los Angeles base, and there's Palos Verdes Peninsula. And what happened was called urban sprawl. And the impact of it was chaotic. And all the local cities were, had a, well, they weren't able to cope with it. And then California passed the law and said every city shall have a master plan and a zoning ordinance to implement it. And they had to do it. Well, it was good timing for me because I just graduated from USC with a degree in architecture and city planning, which included uh, uh, landscape architecture, urban design, planning and zoning law, and public administration. And I didn't know I was going to use all of them in my career. So here is the area we're talking about. Here is the Plano Tribuco Valley. And we're sitting here tonight. And it was called an urban infill parcel because it didn't exist when we started working there. Here's Mission Viejo, Cota de Casa, Dove Canyon. 100,000 population, 15,000 population, 8,000 population, and we're going to have 50,000 population, but in a very unique design. And here was the Plano Tribuco, which had to be the most beautiful spot for an urban village in an open space setting you could possibly imagine. It was a plain a mile wide, five miles long, and a view corridor that went right up to Saddleback Mountain, the most important landmark in the South County. Creek bed on each side of the plano, 100 feet deep, up to 1,000 feet wide, full of ancient oak trees and multi-generational sycamores. Great, unbelievable setting. And that's the plan for its development, but we had a long ways to go. One thing we do is that it was going to be a very competitive area with Mission Viejo and the adjoining communities there. And so at the first meeting with the marketing consultant, I said, tell me why people are going to drive through Irvine, through Mission Viejo, Foothill Ranch, 
and on a two-lane road out to a cattle pasture at the end of the line. And without hesitation, he said, Richard, one of a kind is never the end of the line. It's the place to be. You create the one of a kind, people will come. Well, that became the prime possible future goal for the entire development to our benefit. And we borrowed a line from the West of the West book and created the phrase, Rancho Santa Margarita, where the West begins again. And it's going to open on May 1st, 1986. And we'd had all kinds of claims, representations in a national advertising campaign. And they were carefully drawn from the goals and objectives and the possible futures of the plan. Because they're not just advertisements, they're promises. And when a master developer says things like this, he's got to develop, and we intended to. So we started looking at the resources and the uh, Tribuco Creek and all the oaks and sycamores, and we, we had basically an arterial highway system. We said, let's pull those trees up in and along the highways so that the nature of the open, permanent open space surrounding is part of the daily drive through the community. And those trees along those highways go a long way to creating a quality image of the city. And a quality image of the city helps to preserve your property values. We uh, located a lake in the what we call the East Lake Village, a golf course, what we cleverly called the golf course village. And then there's the hillside village and a village in the town center. This was the rest of the structure, all of the permanent open space, including a large area along Tribuco Creek that we discovered was a human settlement dating back 15,000 years for people who'd crossed the Bering Land Bridge, made their way down the west coast of the continents and ended up calling this home. So we're not the first ones to live here in a community. And this would be themed by a lake and a park, uh, the town center village by the town center itself, the golf course and the views up here. And when all of that had been calculated in ways I'll show you, the white areas left over is where the homes for 50,000 people were going to be located. Let's look at the town center. We couldn't find a town center for 50,000 people that did what we wanted this one to do. Why 50,000 people? 50,000 population community has been considered the ideal community since the days of the Roman Empire. Big enough to support all of the community facilities for a complete lifestyle expression. It's also small enough to know your neighbor, to know your merchants, and to have the opportunity to participate in local government. So we came up with a new paradigm, which was a sub-regional town center and business park, a central active, very active central plaza, a central park with a meadow and an amphitheater, and a tie over to the intermediate school. The intermediate school was located right here next to the town center in some of the highest value land in the community. Why? Because we have a small central park and we worked with the school district and the school district architects and designed a campus where the academic core could be fenced off and the sports field, the auditorium, the gymnasium, and the food service could function as an extension of the Central Park. We then looked at all those components of the town center and listed all of the activities that were going to be required for that lifestyle. And then that told us what kind of spaces we needed for different kinds of uses, and it could be used for marketing of businesses and so forth. This was then the total structure of the town center, uh, a sub-regional retail center, a large community retail center, 
and at pedestrian Main Street. And our primary precedents for that were Forest Avenue in Laguna Beach and the Main Street in Carmel, California. That was the concept. And we had the center plaza, the center park, and then the sports fields in the intermediate school. And the community trail comes down and goes right through the school into the central park, into the town center, into the residential village. And if you'll notice, how about that? It comes across to a sub-regional sports complex that's bigger than the central park and the intermediate school put together. And the reason we designed that was that when they were building the transportation corridor, they came to us and said, we're a million cubic yards long on our dirt. Do you have a place we could put that? And we said, yeah, we happen to have a very nice place. And so we designed that park with football field, soccer field, half a dozen baseball fields, and basketball courts. Fortunately, they balanced the fill. <laughs> and uh, so we lost that. But when that open space, when the open space was conveyed to the county, it was conveyed to the county with that parcel as a separate legal description in case at any time in the future that people got together and wanted to build that sub-regional sports complex, they knew exactly where the parcel of land was located. We also worked with the uh, library board and the library architect and created a civic center urban design that was Spanish metropolitan in character. And it was hoped that the city hall and YMCA facility entrance would be right opposite the, the library entrance and that there would be a gathering place courtyard with the fountain in between the two ends, sort of a reception area. Then we turned to the Central Park. And we looked at Maslow's hierarchy of human needs and right at the top is self-actualization, which is kind of like saying lifestyle enhancement opportunity. And we took those ideas and developed our own intensity of expressive involvement, we call it, the various intensity of activities you can engage in in your leisure time. That you from very intense, which are basically team sports activities, and all of the outlying neighborhood and community parks fall in that category. Team sports activities fall in the very intense, uh, and the gymnasiums and the uh, martial arts gyms uh, and elsewhere in the community, those are very intense. But when it comes down to medium, medium low, and low, just relaxation, all of these kind of activities are what go in the town center, the central park, and the lake park uh, over in the East Village. We then said, well, what are those forms of leisure activity? And then what are the specific facilities that you need in order for those activities to be available? Then we took this column with all the black dots, and all of those were the kinds of facilities that a master developer normally provides in any subdivision. Local schools and parks, uh, local shopping centers, uh, preschools, that kind of thing. But over here now, where you see the dots are open, these are all the kinds of activities that do not normally happen by a private developer. You don't find them in Cota de Casa, Del Canyon, or even Mission Viejo to any extent. But those are the kind of activities that would, act, would happen in a viable town center for a community of 50,000 people and a market area of almost a quarter of a million people for their retail and office activities. This then became all of the community facilities related to that lifestyle expression systems. The Lake Park, the Central Park, none of these are to scale, by the way. The Catholic High School, the Intermediate School with its sports facilities. And here, here was that Chiquita Ridge Park. And the rest are all the community and, and local parks. The Central Park, we hired Walker and Macy in Portland uh, because they developed Pioneer Square in some of the most unique city parks you'll find anywhere in America. Pioneer Square is probably the most active, well-used uh, downtown plaza, if you will, in America. 
In fact, they program activities in the park every week. Every week, there's a different activity going on. Flower show, uh, craft show, whatever it is. They, they got a whole schedule that they perform. Then they developed a concept for the Central Plaza, and that little part of it there, uh, next to Panera Bread and the, and the theater, that was called the Avenue of the Stars. And it didn't mean Hollywood stars. It meant anybody in town that had a talent. And that flower bed that's there now was supposed to be a stage where anybody in town could get up on that stage and recite their poetry or play their instrument or sing their songs or whatever. And that was the way they were going to activate the plaza for that. Then it came through here, and across the way was to be the main central plaza. And it was thought during celebratory events that El Paseo would be closed and this entire area would become part of the celebratory event along with the park. And around the central plaza was a unique concept for restaurants surrounding the plaza, mix of restaurants and retail overlooking the plaza and overlooking the Central Park and the continuation of the plaza out there. And there'd be uh, light towers and splash fountains here where the kids could play while the parents are sitting at the restaurant. And then there's the meadow and the amphitheater. But then in all of the rest of it was what they call it garden rooms. In those garden rooms, out from the Central Plaza, around the meadow and around the amphitheater were all of those activities that we had identified for full expression in a central park for a town of 50,000 people. We looked at it six different ways. The basic structure of the design, uh, the age groups that would be used it, the community trail that would come through it, the adjacent uses around it, the phasing, and the Larian especially, because the Larian, it's a small center of park. And so it had to be designed with facilities in each one of those garden rooms that could be used by different age groups at different times. Otherwise, the same facilities designed to have multiple.